little brief intro. My name is Scott Johnson. Um, I live in Northwest Georgia, not too far from uh, where Catherine and Daniel and Julie are living. Um, we've had the pleasure of getting to know them personally over the last few months and uh, become good friends. Um, I want to thank you for allowing me to share with this group. I've heard great things about you guys. And so I, I, I humbly um, thank you for letting me uh, share today. But if you don't mind, let's have a prayer together. Father God in heaven, we thank you and praise your holy, gracious name. We we ask that your presence will be with us today. Lord, the words that I speak, let it be your words out of my mouth. Um, should anything be untoward, God, please twist those words to be correct in the ears of those that hear. Let us, Lord, live our lives to glorify you. In the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. All righty. Let me uh, start my little slideshow quickly here. I'm going to start this with a few verses before I roll into what I have to say today. Psalms 19.1 tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Psalms 145.5 says, I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. Proverbs 6.6 6 tells us, go to the ant, thou sluggard, and consider her ways, and be wise. Job 12 we hear, but ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, who knows not in all these things that the hand of the Lord has wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind. Isaiah 48, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Romans 1, verses 19 and 20. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And a nice little one from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 6. Next to the Bible, nature is to be our great lesson book. Well, I am not a farmer, and some of you may be. I never grew up on the land. I grew up in cities of varying sizes from around Phoenix, Arizona to Chicago and smaller areas like Tappahannock, Virginia, and so forth. But I never grew in the land area to grow things. But my wife and I, we brought some, brought, bought some property about three years ago, and we moved on this property about two years ago. We built our house. And we actually moved into it at almost a year ago this week. We've been trying to grow a garden, growing orchard the last couple of years with varied success. But I want to share with you some of those lessons the Lord has taught me about his nature of the last few years. Certainly, I can't share you all the lessons. And I'm sure you guys have some great lessons of your own that I would love to hear as well. Now, please bear with me. Again, I am not a farmer. I am not a gardener yet. I'm still growing and learning. So if you hear some things that are odd, just know it's because I'm very new. I don't have a green thumb yet. It's coming by the grace of God alone. But I want to share with you some things that I have learned from what God has shared with me. First is my grapevines, lessons from our grapevines. So we bought a couple of grapevines from a, uh, a home nursery a couple of years ago when we first moved out here before we had uh, our home built. Um, and then we bought four vines from Costco last year. Um, the, <laughs> the two we got from a home nursery, they actually stayed in their pot for an entire year. We didn't plant them in the ground. They sat out in the yard with rain or no rain, and it was just silly. Um, and then the ones that we got from Costco, we got out and, and 
pretty quickly planted those in the ground with the two from our home nursery. And of course, the one from the home nursery, one actually flourished, one never made it. But watching these uh, five plants grow, these five vines grow, I noticed that they all grow at different rates. Even the four of the same age, they grew at different rates. And no matter what I did, my watering, my giving them nutrients, they just would grow on their own. I've got four kids. All my kids grow at different rates. Now, physically, yes, but they all grew in the same house, had the same parents, had the same lessons, but they all grow differently. They grow spiritually differently as well. As believers, we grow different, differently at different rates. But what's interesting is even though we grow at different rates, there's still life in the vines and there is still growth one way or the other. The Lord is doing his work and praise God for that. You know, I can't get mad at the vines for their slow growth. I can just tend to my vines and give them love and care. Give them what I can to help their growth. Same thing with my kids or with other believers, other friends. The Lord will do his good work, and I can do whatever I can do for the Lord. But whatever growth they have, praise God, it's still growth. Now, it's interesting when we got our Costco vines, the instructions with little tag was sitting on the little plant to tell us how to do that, which was helpful because... I've never grown grapevines before. I tried to look at some YouTube videos as well to get some information, but the instructions on the, uh, the, the card for the vines were don't prune the first year and don't water very much. I really wasn't sure why. That's just what the instructions were. I did some more YouTube video watching to see what to do and saw some varied instructions, but I found some videos that actually backed up what this card was saying and said, don't prune those vines the first year. Let them grow kind of wild. Just let them go. And where they grow, let them grow. And, and I'm watching them and, and seeing what's going on and, and then understanding, well, we, we've heard about the science of plants and trees and science class growing up. And those leaves, they will suck in the light from the sun and bring that nourishment from the leaves to the vine to grow strong vines and to give strength to the vine. And I said not to water it very much. And I was watching a scientist. He was saying, if you, do, if you water too much of that grapevine, then the roots won't actually dig deep into the ground to find water for themselves. They'll just stay superficial. And when the winter comes, the vines will die because that root has not been able to have the time and the energy to search out the water from deep in the ground. It won't survive the hardships ahead because it didn't have a root. And I was thinking, too often we love to prune others without letting them grow and get rooted in God and his word. When we prune, that life-giving power of the sun might get hindered from reaching them. A condemned heart is full of guilt and loss, and too often they begin hiding from the Lord and possibly drying out. Or we tend to overwater someone with this new amazing truth that we have. We use a fire hose every day instead of gently watering and helping them search out the water of life for themselves. With so much dependence on us for providing Christ to them, what happens when we're not available or they move away? There is no root. The winter comes and the vine cannot live. They've never learned how to search out Christ on their own. John 7, 37 tells us, In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man, man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Acts 17, 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. 
in John 15, 39, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Those scriptures are those who teach us about Christ. Now, my vines will not bear fruit, bear fruit this first year, but I am supposed to prune the branches and the fruit the second year so that they'll have better growth even after that. In fact, I am told that grapevines require constant pruning for great growth. And although I did not prune my vines this first year, the deer did their best to prune for me, but just the leaves, not the branches. And although an enemy of my vines came to devour the leaves as they were chewed off, interesting, my branches grew even more, and that main vine has grown thicker and higher. I think of Proverbs 3. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, even as the father the son in whom he delights. Happy is the man that finds wisdom and he that gets understanding. John 15, we read, I am the true vine and the father is a husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, yet abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples." Now, my grapevines teach me that first, I cannot expect everything, everyone to grow the same, but I need to allow each to grow at the pace that they can. I need to tend to them carefully, but help and encourage them to have deep, strong roots. I need to give them time to grow with stability, being rooted before pruning. And when I am pruned by the Lord, I need to remember that it is by his love that the pruning occurs. There are many more lessons from the grapes that I can learn and that I will learn. But we're going to move on to my peach trees. <laughs> now, my peach trees, we got a few, three small peach trees from a friend. They've got a lot of peach trees on their property and they, they had some buds and they're all about the same size. So we went to go and prepare them for transplant. Christ's Object Lessons, great book, page 56. It says, the garden of the heart must be cultivated. The soil must be broken up by deep repentance of sin. Well, so we did that. Now, if anybody knows anything about Georgia, especially North Georgia, we are known for our clay, Georgia red clay. My property, I think, is about 95% clay with a little bit of rock and some dirt mixed in there. So we dug out large holes, removed the clay, put in some good soil mixed with leaves and mulch and sand and compost and, and made a nice environment for these trees to grow put a good sturdy rock in there for it to grow on. Which made me think of Psalm 62 too. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. 
Isaiah 28, 16, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation that he believe, he that believeth shall not make haste. And also 2 Timothy 2, 19, nevertheless, a foundation of God stands sure, having his, this seal. The Lord knows them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Just like my desire for strong, healthy peach trees, I put them on a strong, steady rock. I can't expect to grow strong and healthy unless I'm growing on that strong rock of salvation, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, interestingly, the, the three trees, one grew a little bit better, the largest of the three trees and their growth quickly, or is again, like my vines, devoured by a deer. <laughs> Early in the spring, it was large and lush. It was beautiful. I had great expectations for this peach tree. At the end of the summer, there's almost no growth whatsoever. And there's a couple little leaves in the top. But there's two new shoots coming from the bottom of the trunk. Found it very interesting. I look at Mark 4, 4. And it came to pass as he sowed that some fell by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Song of Solomon 2, verse 15 says, take us the little foxes, the, the, uh, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine for our vines have tender grapes. Now, although it wasn't seed or vine, but leaves, and though not fowl or foxes, but deer, the idea is similar. Something from outside came and plucked up the growth. There was not protection from the outside forces, but because these trees were most prominent, the most tempting, they were the ones picked to be devoured. Another thought came to mind. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. In John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Thinking of that tree. There are times when we seem to have everything going for us. We appear to be, to have everything that we need. You know, we might have a little pride in ourselves for the things we have, the things we've learned, things that are going well. We might forget to humbly submit to God and acknowledge that these blessings are from him. And just when we're not, when we're not watching, the devil comes by and plucks away all of our glory. But, you know, the smallest tree of the three had hardly any growth at the beginning of the spring, and it took a long time for growth to show up. In fact, to the deer, it was not delightful at all. The deer completely ignored that little tree. In early spring, I was actually not sure if it would make it. But by the end of summer, that little tree is phenomenal. It has grown so much. It is more than tripled in size. So I was thinking about the deer and my tree and its growth. Matthew 10, 22, and ye shall be hated of all the men for my sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. You know, my little tree was despised and hated by that deer because it had nothing to show, nothing to eat, nothing to nourish them with. But that tree endured heat and sun and dryness, it endured monsoons and rain that would not end, and it's come out stronger than all the other peach trees. I think of Joel 3.10, let the weak say I am strong, and it has happened. It has happened because of the power of God through that tree. It has taken a beating in many ways through nature and through the weather, but it has become strong. 
you know, sometimes having a little is just what you need to know you need God. Sometimes being small keeps you out of the enemy's eyesight. But staying steady and strong with the Lord, he will increase us. Matthew 13, 23 tells us, but he that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it and also bears fruit and bring us forth some a hundredfold, some 60-fold, and some 30. And that's exactly what that nice little peach tree has done for me. Well, I have more trees in the garden that I've learned from this year. It's pretty, been pretty exciting. The apple trees. Now, the apple trees had another story. We bought them um, all at the same time. We have three trees, about the same size, same stock, from the same source. And I believe they may even be the same variety. Maybe there's one different. I'm not 100% sure. But, you know, one of those trees flourished amazing it had such amazing growth the branches on there grew large the leaves grew large it has probably grown three feet in height just this summer and uh it was amazing to watch grow i think of matthew 13 12 for whoever hath to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance. That's that first tree I think about. It had and it grew. It had much more abundance. But the rest of this verse, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even he that hath. Well, one of my trees had little and it didn't grow and it never changed until it eventually just was lost. That tree dried up, brittle, fully dead, and it was taken away. Whatever it had was gone. Its spot was moved and replaced by another tree, which we'll talk about later. Maybe think again of Revelation 2.5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works or else I shall come quickly and remove thy candlestick or thy tree out of his place, except thou repent. That tree would not, could not stand and continue its love of life for whatever reasons, and it was removed out of its place. And then there was one more tree. Now, this little tree was interesting. It had some growth on there, some strong growth. But then throughout the summer, throughout the, the early part of the spring year, before summertime, the main part of that tree from near the base, above two shoots, just died, dried up and died and broke off. But just below where it broke off, two little shoots sprouted up. And I've been watching that little tree over the summer. and from the ground to where the shoots are probably isn't six inches but where the base of the shoots are to the top of their branches now about five feet those trees that those branches from the tree just exploded and although it's not as tall as the first tree i talked about first apple tree it has grown easily 10 20 times its original growth <laughs> and i was thinking about where's my cursor? Here we go. What I was think about um, John three. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind blows where it lists, and thou hearest the sound of it, but thou cannot tell where it comes from and whether it goes. And so is the one born of the Spirit. You know. I don't know where growth is coming from in my plants, my trees. I don't know how they're going to survive. Who's going to grow great? Who's going to grow slow? Who's going to get big or small? I can't tell where the growth is coming from. I had zero hope in this little tree. But the Lord saw otherwise. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not unto its countenance or unto height of its stature, 
because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. For the man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You know, I saw that little tree and I saw some death and some waste, but God saw hope and life. Deep inside, there was a plan. I placed it in the ground and watered it, but God took this little tree and brought new life into it. How careful we must be when we look around us to those close to us, to those we don't know walking by, and we'll see death and waste on that outward appearance of someone, someone who Christ died for, someone whose Christ gave his life for, not knowing that that seed of life, that seed of Christ has been planted in that person. And he's taking time to care for it, to love it. And who knows when that spirit will just empower that seed to grow and new life will occur. And what we saw as death and waste is going to be changed into new growth and new life and something beautiful for the Lord. You know, Matthew 13 tells us, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing ye hear, and shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall, ye shall see, and not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they shall see, and your ears shall hear. You know, Christ taught us in parables. And use nature in as a primary source of knowledge. Each of my apple trees in their own way have offered a new look at our Savior. They are each a parable unto themselves. Ezekiel 37. Very powerful. And the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones and caused me to pass by round about. And behold, there was a, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, thou knowest. And again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause enter to enter unto the breath and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring upon flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And I prophesied, there was a great noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the sinews, uh, upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. Then I said unto, then he said unto, he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon the slain, that I may live. So I prophesied, as he commanded me. And the breath came into me, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dry, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy unto them, thus saith the Lord God, 
Behold, O oh my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And I shall place in your heart, I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Just like that little apple tree that looked dead, new life was brought forth. As in the dry bones, we cannot give up on those that look dead, that are dry. We must continue to pray for, to care for, and love every child of God no matter what the state they appear to be in. We do not know when and how the Spirit of the Lord will work in their lives, bringing forth new growth, turning life, or turning death into life. Well, now it's the apricot tree's time. So I purchased a few trees on sale a few months ago because normal planting time was over. And uh, they were just hanging out, not being sold, and I wanted some new trees. I thought of Matthew 20, verse 6 and 7. <laughs> and about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all day idle? And they said unto him, Because no man has hired us. And he said, Go, ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that you shall receive. Well, I saw these idle trees just sitting around at the store. And of course, they were on sale too. And I wanted some new trees for my orchard. So I went ahead and got them in what seemed to be the planting season's 11th hour. Like the peach trees, I prepared the ground and planted those trees the best that I could. And wouldn't you know, shortly after, we had a deluge of rain for weeks. I'm sure folks across this country in the US here uh, experienced the same thing in different parts. During the summer, we had dry, no rain for a long time. And then all of a sudden the rain came and would not stop. Well, my apricot trees, they got plenty enough water. They got too much water and every leaf fell off the trees for a while. I had zero growth. I couldn't see anything. I thought these trees were dead. I thought they had drowned completely. But after a few weeks, after the sun was out, dried up the ground, gave them some warmth, finally some small buds showed up on my tree and eventually some leaves sprouted. It's not a huge abundance, but it's certainly making its path again to new growth. You know, it is small growth, but growth is growth. And that is a good thing. And I was reading Gospel Worker. And here's an interesting thought. We may commune with God in our hearts. We may walk in companionship with Christ. When engaged in our daily labor, we may breathe out our heart's desire, inaudible to any human ear. But that word cannot die into silence, nor can it be lost. Nothing can drown the soul's desire. It rises above the din of the streets, above the noise of machinery. It is God to whom we are speaking, and our prayer is heard. You know, just like this little tree whose desire was to live, and although placed in a rich environment, the storms, and the floods attacked it. What once seemed to be a perfect place now seemed to be nothing more than a pretty place to die. But that soul's desire, a tree's desire to live, could not be drowned. The life from the seed did not die, and it was not lost. And just like those who are beaten down, going through rough times in life, when all the external signs of life seem to be removed, when the seed in our life is that of the word of God, 
it will remain. Life will continue to take hold. And when the storm, storm subsides, the life of God will reinvigorate and make us stronger. My little cherry tree. <laughs> My little cherry tree. This is, again, one of the trees that I bought past planting season, sitting idly at the store. Again, I brought my tree home. I prepared the ground, cut a large hole in the ground and took out the clay and the dirt and the rocks and put some good soil in there and planted it. But this idle tree, it was already leaning a little bit. It was kind of bent, not a lot of strength in there, but it had leaves and I had high hopes for it. Unfortunately for this tree, the rain came as well the deluge of rain for weeks and drown this little tree out. But the leaves stayed during the rain, which surprised me for weeks. However, after many weeks, those leaves fell off. And those leaves have not come back. It's just my skinny little tree with one little branch and no leaves. And it looks lifeless and it looks dead. It looks hopeless. Well, I went, took the branch and bent a little bit and it is still soft. It's still pliable. I kind of dig my fingernail in the trunk and it's not dry. There's still life in there. And there appears to be no growth of that tree so far. But I know that it's there and there's still life, which means the roots are still reaching and growing sturdy in the ground. I'm hoping and praying that next season, it will provide much more than it's showing this year. I got to thinking about a verse, which is actually two verses, Isaiah 42, 3. And then quoting Christ, quoting Isaiah, quoting Christ again, if you look at it that way, is a bruised reed shall he not break and the smoking flax shall he not quench. And if you look at the differences between Isaiah and Matthew slightly, he shall bring forth his judgment unto truth till he brings, till he send forth judgment unto victory. You know, my cherry tree is soft and tender with no visible growth in life, but it stands as a bruised reed, but not broken. Jesus in the book of Matthew quotes Isaiah. And talks about bringing, uh, bringing or sending forth judgment. Isaiah says unto truth. Matthew relates unto victory. But what is that judgment unto truth or unto victory? John 14, 6 says, Jesus said unto them, I am the way and the truth and the life through our Lord Christ Jesus. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, through times, the times we may stand as a bruised reed, when planted upon the rock of salvation, the judgment of Jesus Christ is sure. And we shall have our victory in the Lord, in his truth. Truly, thanks be to God. Now comes our mulberry bush. This is the one that replaced the apple tree that got plucked out of the ground. Now, my wife purchased this tree due to its beauty. It was lush. It was gorgeous. And we were excited about this mulberry tree. And wouldn't you know, in the night, the deer came and they devoured the leaves of that mulberry tree within weeks of planting it. <laughs> Matthew 24, 43 says, but know this, if that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and he would have not suffered his house to be broken up. 
had I known the deer were going to come, I would have done something. I probably should have known the deer were going to come. They came before. But I would have done something to prevent the demise of this beautiful tree. But I was not watching, and I did not prepare ahead of time. My little tree was torn asunder. What was full and lush became a disappointment. However, because the soil was good and the root is strong, and despite the hour's attacks, this tree has since, after that attack, become one of my most beautiful gar uh, trees in the orchard. You know, and thinking about the deer again, I decided, let's see what we can do to protect my trees from further attacks. So a fence was put up around the trees and the bushes, and this has actually repelled the deer from eating up my trees. Proverbs 4.23 says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You know, some verses say, guard your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Um, there's another quote in a, in a uh, periodical, the Columbia Visitor from October of 1912. It says, Satan is striving to mold us into his likeness. Christ waits to give us power to resist the enemy's temptations. With deepest interest, the universe of heaven watches the conflict between Christ in the person of his saints and the great deceiver. Dear youth, you cannot afford to make mistakes in this conflict. Guard your spirit, guard your words, guard your actions. Open your heart and mind to the impressions of the Holy Spirit and be determined to stand for truth in righteousness. He who knows your weakness will impart to you strength. Angels will work in your behalf, enabling you to stand firm for God. We need to remain on guard day and night. We need to be sure not to allow the enemy to invade our hearts and mind, our words, our actions, but instead allow the fathers in Christ's spirit with their angels to strengthen us to stand for God. You know, however, <laughs> this kept us also, this fence, this protection, it also kept us from tending to the base of the trees. And that allowed the grass and the weeds to take over at the base, causing much needed water for the trees to be used by the unwanted growth. In Christ's object lessons, we read, poisonous satanic plants must be uprooted. The soil, once overgrown by thorns, can be reclaimed only by diligent labor. So the evil tendencies of the natural heart can be overcome only by earnest effort in the name and strength of Jesus. Left unattended, many in our garden, within the fenced areas become overgrown by weeds to the point that the weeds are larger than the trees themselves. You know, outside threats were repelled, but close-up care was neglected. Thus, one peach tree failed to thrive. Other trees, though growing, lost some important care. Too often, Christians depend more upon the guardrails of life than the life-changing power of Christ. We eat right, dress right, go to church, turn on Christian radio. You know, all those wonderful things that show that we are good Christians or, or good Adventists. But what do I surround my life with close up? What do I put in my heart and my mind? What is growing in and around me? Am I letting the seeds of God, I'm sorry, am I letting the seeds of Satan grow so close that the weeds are sucking the life from me? The strength of God is not being allowed to wash through me. Guards are good, but we must tend to the life 
inside the guards as well. Continue to purge sin and Satan from our lives with the power of Christ coursing through our lives and let his spirit fill every spot in us, not allowing the works of evil to take root and still our much needed water of life. You know, tending to the trees and the vines, no fruit as of yet has appeared, but diligent work is being rendered to these plants to give them the best environment to produce good fruit. I am not always successful with my work, and sometimes I create a less than ideal environment. <laughs> that has happened in my own life, in the life of my kids, and I'm sure it has happened in the life of others to whom I should have been ministering. What work I am able to provide to make the fruit grow? Question again, what work am I able to provide to make the fruit grow? None. I mean, I can help with the soil. I can help with the watering. I can help with protection, but God must give the sun. And God must provide the life-giving power. And God must nourish for growth of fruit. And when I see my care for the soil, for the plant, for the person is not providing the goodness that I can provide, that I should provide, I should immediately repent and correct my actions for the good of the plant, of the person. I should go to the master farmer and ask for help with the garden that he has provided. Then, with his help, lovingly, tenderly care for that branch, that tree, that child of mine, the child of God's, the only way that I can. In my own life, am I burying rocks and clay in my own soil? Am I hardening my own heart with distrust and vain attempts to, make my, to manage my life myself? Am I sowing seeds of, and, of tares and weeds in my own soil? What am I listening to, watching, reading? Who am I listening to for advice or hanging around with? What is being planted in my soil? And do I go to the water of life for drink? Or am I going dry? Am I going to Jesus? And am I going to the word of God to sustain me? To fill my veins with the life-giving power or putting his word aside and becoming spiritually dehydrated? Am I giving my life the protection it needs to be safe from those who want to pillage the good of my life? Am I praying for the spirit of God to fill me and for the angels of the Lord to surround and protect me? Am I making the conscious effort daily to consecrate my life to God and to his will? Am I doing those things? that will provide the environment for God to grow his fruit in my life. <laughs> that fruit, that glorious fruit we see in Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. You know, there's two things that I've thought about recently regarding fruit. The first, the trees and vines do not bear fruit for themselves. The fruit is always for another, for someone else. The fruit from plants are there either to nourish another creature or to provide seed for another plant. When fruit is produced in us, it should be solely for the purpose of uplifting and sustaining another. We are not to retain the fruit on our branches. What happens when fruit stays on a branch too long? It rots, it becomes stinky and slimy. It's quite repulsive. We must be ever ready with fresh, ripe, vibrant fruit. Second, a fruit does not change its fruit according to the one who is taking the fruit from the tree. It is unchanging. Malachi 3, 6 tells us, For I am the Lord, I change not. 
the fruit of the Lord, that the fruit that the Lord bears is the same for all, for everyone. It's the same fruit. The fruit that is sweet for one person is also sweet for another person. Galatians 3.38 reminds us that there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. You know, too often, mankind, or more specifically myself, will gladly share love and joy and peace with one person to whom I deem worthy of my love and my joy and peace. But then another comes along to whom I think is a little less worthy, and they may receive resentment or anger or frustration. The fruit of the Spirit of God does not do that. I pray that we all will be planted well and tended well, that our Maker will do his good work in us, and that we will labor diligently for the Lord. As Corinthians 5.58 tells us, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Lord has provided to us a garden, not only for our physical nutrients, but spiritual as well. I look forward to the continued lessons he has shared with me and want to know more about lessons he's learned from you as we walk on this planet. I pray his fruit flourishes in our lives, that we may share his love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control to everyone around us, planting the word of God in the lives of others, that they may experience the pleasure of producing heavenly fruit for someone else. Let us labor with Christ, not laboring in vain, tending carefully and thoughtfully to nourish as many as we can with the heavenly fruit of the Spirit of God, and so his word liberally until we see our blessed Lord in the clouds of glory. Father God in heaven, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your mercies and love. I thank you for your blessings of Jesus Christ. I thank you that your word can be a seed in us and that you will grow your word in our lives and in the words of others. Lord, help us to be those children that will take your word to the world, that we will be honorable to everything <clears throat> that you've given to us, and that we will uplift you in all that we say and do. I thank you and praise you in the name of our glorious son, in the name of your glorious son, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. That was really, really nice, Scott. I really enjoyed that. Very welcome. Praise the Lord if it came well. Praise the Lord. Brother Scott, when you're talking about like, you know, the plant is growing in that different, you know, way. It's God who uh, make it grow the way that God see it. And I, it reminded me about last night, I talked to a friend, a Cambodian, and um, he was uh, uh, concerned about their sibling who really so, so, um, believe firmly in the trini trinity and um it's it's and it's been like a long time you know and they still keep thinking that how come they cannot see the truth about you know god is only one and so it did remind me also i'm just say uh yeah you you have to let the god work in their heart they want to be right they think them they they consider themselves like we are right what we believe in that trinity and so on and quote the ellen white words also and uh the only thing i i mentioned to them i said that if people still searching and want to be right with god we love god to work in their heart because we can't not um i wouldn't say force but like 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 want so much for them to accept you know when they still not see that but they they consider that they study too but they did not see so 
I felt that yes, if they do really have the heart searching, God, God has His time and God has His way to bring them to the truth. Because I believe myself before did not believe in one true God either. I didn't think of that. I was thinking, you know, Trinity is nothing wrong about that. And yes, God has His time and His way to bring those who are really sincere. Maybe like Apostle Paul who did not thing that he's wrong and god bring him to the truth brought him to the truth amen so true we have all these messages as uh, the people have said crystal says thank you brother scott for the wonderful nature lesson there's many thanks and amens and thank you for the shanti says thank you for the message it's an encouragement for me as i am trying to start planting it's always kind of scary. Oh, and then, yeah. And, and then we have from um, Spitfire Jim. Thank you, Scott. We are the farmers for Abba Father and his son, Jesus. The sow the seeds of love each day. God will send his Holy Spirit and bring the gift of life. Praise the Lord. Amen.